you only go as fast as your arms can go, you know, regardless of how fast your legs go, right? So I think if you focus too much on a quick arm swing at a slow speed, you're gonna get some pretty awkward looking running or their legs are gonna wanna go faster to catch up with their arms. But I think the, the principle that Doug is mentioning there is right on is that it's going to facilitate more of that lean because it's going to increase your speed and velocity of movement. We got a lot of great stuff in this Run DNA podcast episode. So if you're listening, we're going to talk a lot about the three gate categories that we haven't covered yet, the bouncer, the weaver, and the glute amnesiac. Lots of really good input. Even dive in deep onto some of the things that you might not have always considered with glute amnesiac. And then make sure you listen all the way through. Scott and I had some fun conversations about his 5K training, and I got Scott to agree to something at the end of the podcast. And and it's going to be hopefully a listener engaged experience at uh, a conference next year. So take a listen. I hope you enjoy it. And thanks for listening to the Run DNA podcast. Hey, everybody. Doug Adams here with Scott Greenberg. Welcome to the Run DNA podcast. We are excited to bring you another fresh episode. This time, we're going to chat a little bit more about the gate categories that we cover in our Certified Running Gate Analyst courses. So if you've ever thought, hey, my running form or the, the runners that I'm working with, the form doesn't look just right, but you're really looking how to identify how you can address certain mechanics, this is where that comes from. And if you've missed some of the other podcasts, this really comes out of the understanding that there's no necessarily perfect way to run, but there are imperfect perfect ways that you can run that we know contribute to excessive forces that lead to injuries or loss of performance. So to make it easier, instead of trying to say, well, this person's knee is landing at 10 degrees and uh, flexion and their foot is at 35 degrees of uh, in relationship to the vertical, we say that person's overstriding. We're using these categories as a way to have a common language and really understand how to attack them. So that's what we want to go through. We've gone through overstrider and we've gone through bouncer. And if you haven't listened to those episodes, I highly recommend those. Got to those collapser. Are collapser. 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 Excuse me. Yes, we went overstrider and collapser. And those are the two most common. And that was really good episodes, just understanding what the mechanics are with some of that. So now I was reading my notes. We're going to go into the bouncer <laughs> and start talking about some of the other categories here. So um, bouncer, Scott, uh, how often do you see this? I'd be curious, especially because were you with your work at, with more field athletes? Um, I'm curious how often you see some of these bouncing mechanics. Um, I think I see them for various hosts of different reasons, but we do see them. Sure. I think it's, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we want people to, I think, I think bouncing is one of those things we have to kind of clarify some too. So like when we run, we do want to have some vertical oscillation, right? We just don't want to mm -hmm. have too much vertical oscillation. We want to be, right. we want to be springy in our, in our attack of the ground, but at the same time, we don't want to take our body too much in the vertical up and down directions when we want to go more horizontally. So uh, I tend to see a lot of my bouncing mechanics when people tend to extend and land with their knee too stiff um, mm -hmm. because what that does is it takes them to that maximum point of knee flexion right at mid stance. And that displacement, ang that angular displacement is quite significant when you land with a straighter knee versus when you land with a slightly flexed knee, say 20, 25, 30 degrees, which is kind of in the ballpark of what we typically like. So um, again, bouncing is, is, is not necessarily bad. Too much bouncing is bad. Collapsing isn't bad. Too much collapsing mm -hmm. is bad. Overstriding right. is bad, but there's varying degrees of overstriding and very uncommon for people to land directly you, underneath their center of you mass. You can't understride. If you understride, you'd fall on your face. Correct. <laughs> correct. Yeah. So with, with everything, with all of this, right, there's, there's, there's some degree of normalcy and then there's going beyond that, right? And, you know, with everything we do, what is normal, what is abnormal, I think it's very much person dependent based on their tissue and what they can tolerate. But there are ranges where we want to keep people to kind of not overstimulate certain tissues, if that makes sense. Yeah, I call this bouncing a Goldilocks category, because we want this to be just right. 
This is a category, like I actually did some research on balancing and published in IJSBT and JOSBT some articles about balancing. And it's basically the vertical oscillation of how much you're going up and down, like Scott was saying, and we need enough to make sure that we're not tripping over our feet as we go forward. But if you go too much, you're wasting energy. If balancing is excessive, it puts a lot of stress on some of the braking musculatures. Like Scott was saying, they're landing with that stiff knee. It can put a lot of stress on the front of the knee. It can put a lot of stress on the quadriceps, uh, even into the lower back. Because if you're not absorbing force at the knee, it's going up to the hip, it's going up to the back, and we can see that people have this. Um, I most commonly see this with a particular athlete, and that's a soccer player. This is one that I see very commonly, the soccer player that's no longer playing soccer. They're getting into running 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, whatever they're doing. And because they're used to running and almost jogging pretty upright, where they're looking to receive the ball or they're looking around what's going on on the, the rest of the field there, that they'll often run fairly upright. And we see that they have high excessive vertical oscillation. from. A standpoint of if we look outside of different populations, another group I really see this in is people with stiff hips. And the reason I've seen that in is if they can't get into that 10 to 20 degrees of hip extension as our foot's getting ready to leave the ground, then the angle of trajectory when they take off is more vertically oriented than horizontally oriented. And this is going to come into play when we talk about glute amnesiac in a second as well, about kind of like how they go into that position. But I've found when we've done the runner readiness assessment, when people have significant limitations in the back bend and we find that they're limited in their hip extension mobility, that bouncing is pretty common. And therefore, it's one of those categories that you really have to think about how you're pairing up your treatment and your gait retraining because you can't just necessarily tell that person like stop bouncing if they don't have the mobility for it there. So I think that's an important point about how we're talking about these categories and we're talking about them in isolation, but it's not even just that they're isolated, they're not isolated between categories, but they're not isolated from impairments too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just think about it. If, if somebody doesn't have the, we'll call it the sagittal plane extension right mm -hmm. in their in their lower extremity when they hit the ground because their leg doesn't go back quite an, as far they're going to have to that that energy is going to have to go somewhere so if it's not getting pushed forward and backwards it's getting pushed up and down that's the bottom yeah. line yeah so for addressing this um i think there's this one's a pretty easy category to change like you can get somebody re to reduce their bouncing pretty easily by just saying hey pick a spot on the horizon try not to bounce up and down so much um if the you know somebody with a ponytail you can say try not to let your ponytail go up and down as much there's some cues i really like the wall drill for this mm -hmm. to give people an awareness of how much they're doing with the sticky note on the wall those are lots of great things that we talk about in the course with it mm -hmm. um the other thing to be aware of is that this is also linked to cadence at times. And that's mm -hmm. what we found in the, I believe it was the JOSBT paper that I published there um, with Joe Zenni, um, that that was one where we saw when you increase your cadence, the vertical oscillation goes down almost the same. It's like a 4% increase in cadence is a 4% reduction in vertical oscillation. Which yeah, they go, from, they go from doing this slow, right, to doing this fast. Yes. So, so in, again, in the definition of bouncing, this looks like they're bouncing, right? Whereas right. this is really the characteristic of the bouncer. So slow cadence looks like this, faster right. cadence looks like this. It's almost like bounding. You should watch the YouTube video Correct. if you want to see yeah, Scott's hand. But it's almost like somebody's bounding or skipping doing some of this as opposed to Correct. really doing that. So um, I also see this sometimes in people that have really um, tried to um, potentially somebody who's forcing themselves to run on their toes. They'll They'll kind of bound or skip a little bit um, if they're not really naturally learning how to run on their toes and they're just trying to run on there, we'll see a little excessive bouncing as well in that. But 
Um, I find this one's a pretty easy fix. This one's not hard, whether you're looking at it from a cadence perspective or you're looking at it just from a pure vertical oscillation perspective, it can definitely be helpful. But it also is one that makes a big difference for people. When you reduce some of that, you're going to get that immediate impact where when they stop bouncing, they notice that running is much less stressful and that they're even going to notice an improvement in their performance when you bring this down. So it's an important yeah. category to address. Yeah, I think you also see a, a, a decrease in the, I'll call it vertical shock, right? The yeah. vertical force into the ground, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they're landing in a more supple position, right? Um, and, and I don't like saying they're landing softer because I think that's, you know, in some of the work that Rich Willie put out, um, landing soft isn't necessarily always a great cue because it yeah. usually involves usually involves the runner actively trying to engage to soften. And what that does is it creates a lot of stress from the gastroc soleus on the on the lower leg muscular uh, bony muscular a bony not bony musculature. The lower leg musculature of the gastroc and soleus create a lot of bony mm -hmm. stress, which yes. um, which is which is obviously not optimal. So um, you just got to be careful of some of the cues and, and just know that if you are doing a cue, no change without consequence sometimes, right? So no, or, you know, so you just got to be aware of what, what you're doing there. Where you're shifting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think it's an important one to make sure that you're really looking at. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It's pretty easy to identify even visually. Um, and a lot of wearable devices now, almost all of them have vertical oscillation. And that was part of those studies was looking at the reliability of wearable devices to check that out. Um, so if you're really, each measurement might be a little different, but if you're over 10 centimeters of vertical oscillation, you probably could benefit from reducing that. So if you're checking out your data, if you're looking at your runner's data, everyone runs with a GPS these days, and you're curious about that, you can look at that pretty easily. Um, all right, let's go into Weaver next, Scott. And then we'll go back to Glute Amnesiac because there's a lot of similarities between Bouncer and Glute Amnesiac with some of that. So, you know, tell us what a Weaver is. In, in simplest terms, somebody that weaves has a lot of transverse plane motion, right? Somebody mm -hmm. that is crossing midline, whether it be with their lower body is typically how we would identify it. But I think the lower body and the upper body go hand in hand, pardon the pun, um, yeah. where, where you're going to see a lot of thoracic rotation, a lot of arm swing that's more transverse plane, uh, prominent than sagittal plane prominence, which is, you know, where you want to go. You want your arms to drive, you want your legs to drive, and they're just leaking energy as they kind of go more in that side to side transverse kind of direction. So, um, yeah. that's probably the best way I describe it. Yeah, it's like basically they land narrow as a lot of times. And there's a lot of reasons that people do that. It might be because it's advantageous for them to reduce the demand on the hip for stability. So they narrow land, or even crossing over to beyond that, right? Over. To the other side, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, because this, with all of this too, is something like uh, Weaver, we're also looking at symmetry. So we're not just looking I, at uh, an absolute value as much as we're looking at one side versus the other. So if somebody could be um, crossing over on both or they could be narrow on both, but I most often I see this as a single sided, somebody doesn't really have the best stability on that side. So they're gonna be going through more transverse plane motion and they wanna place the foot as close underneath the center of mass as they can, because then it's not gonna put as much stress on them dynamically to be able to control their position of their center of mass and maintain stability while they're running. So we often see that. Um, now, it's not only from a stability standpoint, it, there could be mobility restrictions. Somebody Absolutely. could have tight adductors and it could be contributing that when they're going through swing phase, they're going in and they're knocking their knees during swing phase together because the swing limb is tight and it's coming in and it doesn't really allow them to get that straight pathway and they're deviating inwards and then the momentum during swing is going to get them to be um, in that narrow phase too. I, I often, along those same lines, I'll see this even with a collapser at time as well, where somebody with contralateral pelvic drop we're going to see that to have them like if they 
whether they compensate or not, if they're not compensating, they're they're kind of letting that leg go inwards a bit, the, the swing limb, as they're going in, and that can affect it. But if, even if they do correct it, they're kind of swinging it up and around, and they're circumducting, and then the circumduction gate, the momentum swings it back in, and by the time that they land, they're landing underneath of their center of mass. Mm -hmm. So this might be something that you see in combination with that collapser often. And addressing the collapsing mechanics might actually fix some of the weaver characteristics because you're not uh, having to have that momentum swinging in with them. Yeah, yeah I, again, lack of mo lack of mobility in the thoracic area, I see it a lot too. People yeah. start to start to drive their arms instead of allowing mm -hmm. the rotation to occur in other places, and the driving of the arms, crossing their body with their with their swing with the, of their arms then obviously creates that same type of me mechanism in the lower body too. So yeah. those, like I said, right shoulder, left leg go together and vi vice versa. So um, thoracic mobility in my experience has been something to, to look at. Um, I see this a lot. You mentioned with, um, with soccer players, I see this a lot in like lacrosse athletes, you mm. know, you know, when they run, they, they, you know, they're constantly working transverse plane type of mobility and motion. Yeah and you know having to rotate side to side when they're running with their stick and and i think that just sometimes carries over to some of their other normal just jogging mechanics too yeah i see this uh in trail running population as well the trail runners tend to need more stability and they often run on narrower pathways so it's not uncommon to see this in a trail running group as well and so the, what structures are going to be impacted by this? Like, what are you, like, what are we going to see for somebody that weaves? Like, why do we care that they're weaving? Um, so I think, I think you can see a lot of different things. Again, um, you can look at things such as like, you know, what's happening, what, especially if it's asymmetrical, like is one mm -hmm. side collapsing more than the other based on their weaving being more or less on, on one side? Are they trying to correct for a limb that's maybe appearing longer or shorter, whether you compensate? And maybe if it's a shorter limb that's compensating, may stay more supinated in its posture, whereas a longer limb that's trying to get to the ground may pronate more. As you go across your body, you tend to want to dive in and collapse a little bit more, I see, but not all the time. So I think it's somewhat runner independent there as to or runner dependent there as to um as to how they compensate um you know obviously your hips are going to be put at a slightly disadvantaged position as you're kind of getting narrower and crossing over more um so i think there's a whole host of things that can happen depending on why they're crossing over yeah and if you specific pathologies that you could be aware of if you see somebody with it band type symptoms that is having yeah. some of these weaving characteristics that's a pretty obvious one that we would want to address this because it's going to put that in an elongated position as we're loading it additionally one of the things that i've seen that i get a lot of these runners that come to me because they haven't really been able to get results in other places if they're not looking at gate mechanics but uh peroneals like yeah. if you're if you're getting some issues there you're putting more structures on the lateral side and i've seen people have to because they're landing they'll often land in a little bit more of a supinated position and then they're rapidly pronating down and the uh, peroneals are eccentrically controlling that and it really can cause a lot of uh, perineal tendinopathy there just think where that proneus longus attaches it attaches all the way on the medial side into that first first ray right so yeah. its job is to is to keep that plantar first that plant that first ray plantar flexed so yeah. again you're just elongating that whole lever of work for that for that lateral musculature it band but definitely into the perineal sure yeah Agreed. i think most people think it band for this but i think you can't sleep on this for perineals and if you're seeing that it's something to address so how we address it is again, I think this is a pretty easy category to address. Um, and I see good carryover with this as well. It's mm -hmm. really easy. Uh, this is one of my like four jokes that I have for when we teach courses and things to say, you know, just run down the line on the road, the white one, not the yellow one, you know, the yellow ones in the middle of the road. So you don't want to practice for that one, but take that white line, uh, something uh, where you're not going to get hit by a car uh, and one foot 
is on the line and one foot's not on the line. You can do the same thing on a track. Yeah, you can pick it, you know. Um, I even experiment. I think I tried all sorts of different things to try to put a line down my treadmill. I tried like soap and I tried chalk and I tried all these different things and nothing really worked that great. But um, it really is something that you just say, hey, one foot can touch the line, the other foot can't. And that keeps them aware of it because there's a proprioception aspect of weaving mechanics as well, where they just might not know that they're doing this. It, it's something that they've adopted for some reason, and they're not aware that they're narrow on one side or both sides. So that's a that's a pretty easy one to do. Um, probably suggest go out to a track to do it as uh, as the easiest place there if they're Thank not doing it. Know. What you, you mm -hmm. got to think about of a track, though, is again there is a there is a, a curve to a track, mm -hmm. and the inside leg is going to be the shorter side, so it's probably not going to typically stride quite as long. So if yep. you've got an asymmetry, that's something to just appreciate. You know, if one side is is functioning and maybe crossing over and striding out a little bit more, then maybe that's the side you want to be the inside. So you might actually have them run the opposite direction on the track. So just yep. something to think about. You know, again. You know, use your creativity to, to fix some of these issues if you think something's happening. And and a track is a great place to run because, again, there are some variables that you can control for, such as, you know, the, the canter. You could control the slope. But mm -hmm. there is there is a little bit of a bend to a track, and you just need to account for it. And, you know, it's all hypothesis. So we can hypothesize like, oh, that's the shorter limb or that like that's – but if it doesn't work, just do the opposite. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that works too. Like, oh, it didn't work running to the left, like run to the right. Mm -hmm. um, and you can try, hey, it didn't work putting your right foot on the line. Try the left foot here. Mm -hmm. And we're going for improvement in it and to see if we can notice a change when we do it there. So, mm -hmm. um, all right, let's go on to the final of the five. And remember, we were talking about these in isolation. In level two course, there's 12 categories. And we talk about some of those combinations that we most commonly see and how we're looking at that. Like, for example, an overstrider glute amnesiac is one from the 12. We're going to talk about the glute amnesiac now, but the overstrider glute amnesiac is one of those 12 that we see in the level two course. Mm -hmm. So glute amnesia, um, Scott, tell us what uh, what we're really talking about, and is their butt really asleep? Is their butt really asleep? I don't know if it's asleep. It's just not active when it needs to be active, right? right. So yeah. you know, I see a lot of a lot of hamstring dominance in this category. A lot of um, a lot of again that upright kind of posture. Um, their 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 pelvic tilt will call it's a little bit off. Um, and these are the folks that just, again, I know you're going to tell your story that you like, but you know, that little bit of a lean, right. Getting, mm -hmm. getting them to be a little bit more, uh, gain that assistance from gravity to help activate a little bit. Um, make sure you don't lean at the waist too much. You know, I know Chris powers has done a lot of work on, you know, activating the glutes with a slight flex hip posture, um, which can assist some, um, but it, the, the lean needs to come from the ankles predominantly. And, um, and you just got to, you know, I do a lot of uh, glute initiation work, um, you know, trying to make sure that glutes are stimulated, making sure that they're quote unquote turned on um, and just making sure that they're primed to, to engage. And, um, and I find that helps a lot. Yeah. I, you know, we've gotten some uh, joking feedback about this, right? It's a funny category name, the glute amnesiac, but the glute is working. You are using your glutes. People say like, I don't use my glutes when I run. It's like, if you didn't, you would fall. You do need to use your glutes at some point. Now, are they working as much as they should be? Maybe not. And you're compensating some way or another. But also, I think, you know, we have the basics of the glute amnesiac, right? Where we know that basically somebody is a little bit too upright um, when they're running. And when we run, we should land, uh, you do land a little bit upright and then you fall forward as you run and as you move towards toe off, you're going through a varying degree of motion. Sprinters go through more of that motion, distance runners go through less. So we're looking at this and a lot of times we measure it at mid stance to see where you're at in that progression here, where we want you to be at a certain angle as you're leaning forward. 
Now, with what Scott said, too, and we're alluding to Chris Powers, I've seen some things with this that I think is important for clarification, a little bit going beyond just the basics with this. The 100% agree, you have to lean from the ankles, right? And I used to say, like, you should never bend from the waist. And that was one of those things. But then I started looking at people and I realized that the role of the glutes and we can't forget about the role of the abdominals in this. We're controlling the pelvis too. And if you really start to dive into glute amnesiac, we're also thinking about the pelvis position and where we are and the degree of tilt that they're in. And I think what some of the Chris Powers literature was maybe finding, and I would have loved to see more data on this, is it would help to flex at the waist a little bit more if you're going into an excessive pelvic tilt position. And sometimes you do have to do a little tuck and tilt, I call, where you have to control and get the pelvis back to more of a neutral position, and then you have to lean forward at the ankles. And sometimes that does mean that if somebody is in an anterior t- t- pelvic tilt position, they might need to bring their, and their ribs are flaring out a bit, they might need to bring the rib cage down, but it's not really a bend at the waist is as much as approximating the ribs and the pelvis so that they're going into that position and then leaning forward and staying long like a ski jumper as opposed to bending at the waist. And I think that that's what his studies were really looking to go at. I'd be curious to look at the the pelvic position for the people that benefited most from some of that like bend at the waist um, and engaging it there. I think it's, we really need to control the pelvis so that we're not going excessively into an anterior pelvic tilt or posterior. Some people also excessively posterior tilt in that position and approximate too much, but we need to control the pelvis and then control the lean at the same time. If you just get them to lean and you're not controlling like a sway back kind of position that they're in, it's not really gonna have the same impact as what we're really looking to have there. That's that's what I've seen with this group a bit here. Um, the other, so that was a little bit of a side, and I didn't even tell my story. But the the short version of my story is that you really can be a hero to these like glued amnesiacs because I had somebody come in, literally flew in to see me, had anterior knee pain, couldn't get beyond six miles. Told them I looked at them, and everything else was pretty good. They just needed to lean forward a little bit. Instantly, no pain, ran like eight miles right off the bat, was absolutely fine, never had like pain again for as long as I followed up with them, which was for another two or three years after, just kind of checking up. So um, this can be a really hero. Now, I will say this is one of the harder categories to get people to feel comfortable making a change. This is the category that people are most resistant to in order to change because it feels very weird. This is where I use, we all know I use 3D all the time and I like to have this, but this is where I use 2D as a visual aid where I take the video and I say, okay, just run normally. All right, now lean. And then I show them the two and they're like, that was what I looked like when I was leaning. I felt like I was going to fall on my face, but I barely look upright in this position because there is a really proprioceptive input here that they're not even leaning forward almost at all, but they feel like they're going to fall on their face and it's very foreign to them and they can be resistant to actually changing this. Have you seen that, Scott? Yep, very much. Very much agree. Um, I like I what I found are two things that really help with this. One is the resisted running and having them put it. I literally take a band and put it around their waist and give them that support to let them lean forward. If you don't have a strong enough band, you can have them just put their hands on the console and have a little bit of comfort and then take one hand off and then take both hands off. Um, But the band works really well for me. In that situation, just make sure you don't drop them. It's a lot of paperwork. Mm -hmm. Then um, the other thing that I really find is helpful with this group is cueing arm swing. 
because the arm swing is going to help them avoid some of that feeling of falling forward because they're going to get in a forward lean position. And if they focus on pushing that elbow back, they're going to feel a lot better about leaning forward because it doesn't feel like they're just going to fall on their face as much. So mm -hmm. don't forget the arm swing. A lot of times I'll do the bands first and then I'll follow it up and just let them practice a little bit. And then I'll say, now I want you to focus on pushing your elbow back a little bit while you're doing that. I, I would agree, but I think you got to keep in mind there. That's, that's a great thought, but you got to keep in mind their speed too. So the arm swing mm -hmm. is going to be definitely dictated by how fast you're going. So, you know, like, like we said before, um, the lean increases as you're sprinting. So therefore your arm swing is going to increase as you, that's why sprinters really drive their arms. It's really, that's, you only go as fast as your arms can go and regardless of how fast your legs go. Right. So, um, I think if you focus too much on a quick arm swing at a slow speed, you're going to get some pretty awkward looking running or their legs are going to want to go faster to catch up with their arms. But I think the, the principle that Doug is mentioning there is right on is that, um, it's going to facilitate more of that lean because it's going to increase your your speed and velocity of movement, which again, it also acts as a counterbalance too. Like mm -hmm. that's basically what he's getting at. So um, I, I definitely agree, but I think you just got to be mindful of speed. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to increase the rate of their arm swing as much as where the arm swing is happening in relationship to their torso. Mm -hmm. You want them to be pushing the the elbow backwards to make sure that unless you're running faster than a four minute mile, you basically like you want to be getting that elbow backwards and you don't need as much forward here. It needs to be behind you a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't want to increase the rate. I 100 percent agree with Scott, but you do want to get that to make sure it's happening in relationship to their torso, it's happening behind them a bit more. Yeah, but to go along with that, and I agree, to go along with that, your the amount of, we'll call it arm swing displacement is also mm -hmm. indicative of how fast you're going, regardless of the direction. Yeah. So yes. you, you know, if somebody's going very slow, but they're exaggerating that back motion, it's gonna look very awkward when you watch yes. them run. So you yeah. know, somebody that's going at a very slow space, their arms definitely move, there's definitely some 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 forward and back motion, but it's not, it's not really that exaggerated in one way versus the other. It should be fairly symmetrical. It's just it's just where it's kind of starting and where it's finishing. Yeah. Yep. Um, anything else about glute amnesia from you, Scott? Thoughts nope. on that? We covered it pretty well. So that's the five. That's the now we've covered the five main categories, and I think that those are really helpful to understand. If you want to work with runners at all, if you're a runner curious about your own running form and technique, understanding those five, the impacts, how to address them can really be helpful. Runners should definitely look to seek a professional that's trained in this. Go on our rundna.com and find a certified professional near you to help you figure it out. I think that makes a big difference. So uh, if you want to learn more about those, the courses are a great place. I think you can definitely get a lot more detail about those and a lot of specific drills and exercises and programs that you can do for each of those categories. That's really covered well. Scott and I talk a lot about those in the courses. So um, now before we wrap up, I really wanted to ask Scott a question at the beginning of this. And now I really want to ask him how his 5K training is going. Non-existent. It, it fell apart to be completely what? open. It fell apart. We, um, Are you we still had doing something. the race? No, the race, it actually passed. So we saw, that's what happened. Something came up and we weren't oh. able to do it. So uh, my training got, I, I had a lot of travel. I traveled overseas and, and worked on a, on a cruise ship for a good 10 days, seven, day, seven days. And I was traveling with my daughter for a while and life got in the way of me, of me. My, my lifting actually has, has, has backed off too. Then I hurt my back last week. So it's been, my, my last month has been not my best training of anything. So we got to get back yeah. on the horse. Man. The horse. Yeah, I, I, know. I know. I know. This is an official diagnosis now. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, his back hurts. It's because you stopped running. Your back hurts. It must be. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. I'll, I'll go with that. And it's just because I'm getting old, is what it is. It's. It's. Uh, <laughs> that's the bottom line. It's that. Uh, 
you know, you go to lift something up and you feel your back go and you're like, oh boy, that's going to put me out for at least a week. And sure enough, it was a good week before I can, I started, I got, I did my first lift yesterday nice. after, after a week off. So feeling better today. I actually sleep through the night without, without waking up in, in pain when I go to roll over or something. So uh, I can actually sit now longer than an hour. So that's good. So uh, yeah, I'm mending, uh, I'm mending, but not, mending. not, not, not the best, not the best. Don't Poor get old. Guy. Don't get old. It, it beats the alternative. It beats um, the alternative, right. Yeah. <laughs> Dying young. Um, but it's funny you say that because I went on a cruise as well and they had a nice gym. I got a, I actually, I think ran almost like 40 miles that week on that on that boat but yes. there was one day we were running and we were at kind of rough seas and it was a really interesting experience yeah. going up and down because the like you were going over and i like almost ran and one guy did almost fall off the treadmill next to me yeah uh, it was it was a unique uh training experience there with it so yeah we were, i uh I, I didn't have as much free time because I was actually working. I was the the we'll call it the the the, the cruise ship physio for the performers. So uh -huh. uh, so I was I was quite busy making sure that the uh, the athletes slash performers were staying healthy, and it's more of a Cirque du Soleil kind of show. Yeah, cool. Um, so the the risk is quite high. We we saw yeah. I saw a few injuries while I was on the ship, which obviously you never like to see. No. Um, but they they kept me busy. So. Um, it, it was fun. I got to go to Spain. I got to go to France, which nice. was great. Uh, you know, a once in a lifetime, twice in a lifetime type of experience is the second time I've, I've done it. And, yeah. uh, and I, I absolutely love it. Um, but I, I work my butt off. So it's, it's good though. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. Like when my normal trips to um, people are like, oh, it's so great. You're going with athletes. You're in these like beautiful places. We go to like Switzerland for a high altitude training camp. And it's like, mm -hmm. I, luckily, the track has a great view because I'm there at the track all day working yeah. on athletes there. Yeah. It's like, you know, I get this great view and somebody brings me a, a ham sandwich once in a while. But it's, yeah. it's not quite the glitz and glamour travel that everyone thinks it is with that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, all right. Well, we got to pick a race then. When are we going to be together next? Uh, let's. We need to go. I'll pace you to a five k. What do you want to run? Let's let's pace you to I a five. I can run a five k today. I, I'd probably hurt a lot after, but I I can I can do a five k today if I had to. Um, I, I have when no desire to race one. What like see it? Where's CSM? CSM's in Houston, right? Houston. We could like. What what we should get like uh, see if people think and see if people would bet on a time of like what <laughs> Scott, the time Scott could run yeah. and I'll paint you to it and okay. we'll right. uh, we'll do a run DNA live podcast of Scott on the run we're gonna mic up Scott <laughs> doing a five k like That's they right. did for the baseball all star game That's uh, right they, That's right Yeah we're gonna I'll run with I'll up. run with a selfie stick yeah yeah i I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop my i'll stop my arm swing and just kind of go with a selfie stick. like a gopro and some wireless cams and we'll run a 5k together that will be a fun episode okay. all right scott you gotta start training again come houston or sooner we're gonna get you run a 5k all here right. and right. we're gonna mic you up all right deal it's he yep. said deal we got I this online deal. now. Deal. Yeah, deal. Yep. All right. Yeah. Start signing up to see with Run DNA at APTA CSM. Run a 5K with Scott, mic'd up. Run We're going to see. We'll make t shirts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Old man running. <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. All right. Yeah. Scott's running yeah. and he's not being chased. Yes. Yeah. Monumentous event. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Nobody chasing me. So, all right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. And we are going to, I think we're going to have uh, one more episode and then we're going to take a little break for, um, we have got the walking course coming out and it, I am full on in walking mode and we're going to start filming now I'm here shortly. We're doing a test course here in Delaware next week, and then we're going to start filming that. So uh, keep an eye out for that, but we'll probably take a little break while we do that. But we'll probably have one more episode um, while we're getting that stuff together. So thanks for listening, and thanks, Scott, for being on. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Like what you hear? 
Leave a review of the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Run DNA helps runners and running specialists through education and technology to identify each runner's unique injury profile to avoid setbacks and maximize results. The Run DNA podcast is produced by Ace Running LLC. The Run DNA podcast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can occur. Always seek the guidance of qualified medical professionals before making healthcare decisions. Find us online at rundna.com.